Rebecca Hibner versus one to four. Sweeney, King of Dalary, went astray when he flew into battle. This story tells the why and wherefore of his fits and trips. Why he of all men was subject to such frenzies. And it also tells what happened to him afterwards. There was a certain Ronan Finn in Ireland, a holy and distinguished cleric. He was an active missionary, a real Christian soldier. He was a worthy servant of God, one who punished his body for the good of his soul, a shield against vice and the devil's attacks, a gentle, genial, busy man. One time when Sweeney was still king of Dalera, Ronan was marking out a church called Killini. Sweeney overheard the clink of Ronan's bell as he was marking out the site. And being curious, he, uh, he curious, he asked his people what the sound was. It is Ronan Finn, they said. He is marking out a church in your territory. And what you hear is the ringing of his bell. Sweeney was suddenly angered and rushed away to hunt the cleric from the church. Oren, his wife, tried to hold him and snatched at the fringe of his crimson cloak. But the silver cloak fastener broke at the shoulder. She got the cloak all right, but Sweeney had bolted, stark naked, and a short time later landed with Ronan. He found the cleric glorifying the king of heaven and earth in full voice in front of his psalter, his beautiful illuminated book. Sweeney, Sweeney grabbed the book and flung it into the depths of the cold lake nearby. There it sank without trace. Then he took hold of Ronan and was dragging him out of the church when he heard a cry of alarm. The call came from a servant of Clongall summoning Sweeney to battle at Moira. Sweeney went off directly with the servant, leaving the cleric distressed at the loss of his psalter and smarting from such contempt and abuse. It's good to be back reading in visual again. The co-op has enjoyed preparing its response to Sean Lynch's exhibition, For the Birds. The art reimagines the famous Builehivna myth of which Darina has read opening verse. The story of Builehivna goes that Sweeney, an Ulster king of the 6th century, is cursed by Saint Ronan, who is establishing Christianity in Sweeney's kingdom. The curse bestowed on Sweeney is madness. Sean's recreation of a farm environment, similar to where Sweeney ends his days, is a fresh use of concrete imagery that brings the myth into the present day and gives it a sense of place. T.S. Eliot, Flann O'Brien, Seamus Heaney, W.D. Snodgrass and Paula Meehan are other writers that have responded to Bula Hivna. For the first half of our presentation, the co-op, through their writing, explores Sweeney, the natural world he comes from, his conflict between paganism and Christianity, and of course, his unavoidable madness depicted by the green-eyed sculptor sculpture in Sean's exhibition. These aspects of Willa Hivna are foundation for the facets of human nature that evolve in the transformation that follows, and Sweeney becoming a birdman. Sweeney. I could tell you a story of Mad Sweeney who took to the trees, flapping wildly, ignored by Oren, his wife. She understood no longer his language, his whinging, a birdman speaking in tongues. I know what he felt, what it means to keep company with wild stags in Killarney, Cooley, the barren. I see you in every linnet, red butterfly, green nettle, a king of dark ditches, empty roads. You ignore my cries.
with the birds. I was once clothed in innocence, loved by all. Then I ripped off my robes. You have all seen me naked, shamed, devoid of velvet, silver, and lace. I have become exiled from myself, cursed. I rise up like the birds over marshland, puddles, and moors. Now I eat flowers of the stream and cuckoo flowers where they grow quietly in wetlands. I am still misled by the hag luring me on, like will-o'-the-wisp, an illusion. Until I am lost, I cry with the birds. On St. Patrick's Road, his dog has dreadlocks and sweeps the margin of a quiet road with a busy tail. She barks at the pigs in my broken trailer, en route to the butcher, fine pork for a French market. Globes of thistle hair hang on briar hedges as I change the wheel. Blackberries watch with early red eyes. The high hill is over us. He taps the trailer with his stick his familiar black bowler over a mended suit and butterfly socks. His wild eyes are slate stone, grey as the hill gravel. His voice is gravelly too, and carries on the hill like an echo. The sulphur smell of swine snuffs out the scent of heather and pine. His eyes water and his throat primes as he smokes homegrown in the stodgy air. St. Patrick's carriage broke here, man, under the highest hill in Leinster. Better be New Age than an a la carte Christian on this route. His stray smoke grew the high hill a chieftain over me. Its north slope shaded small farms from long sun. In exile with the swine, his rant has a feeling of preserving gloom for travellers on Patrick's route. The hill is gloomy too. Rain comes from there, building on the briar over me, delicately forming spherical beads on the flat space between the thorns. But the briar is slight and the beads prime to bomb the canopy's underside and the weed he's smoking. A shimmering crash returns the spheres to liquid. The briar that trapped the rain has set it free. The weed is extinguished, but its effect lingers like the weather that plays on my mind, a meadow down in the high field. The hay will be soggy. My clothes are soggy. It pulls on my humour and I sulk. He soaks my mood, places a hand on each side of his black bowler to scold. Do you pray for hay weather in the high field? New age travellers don't pray or keep animals enslaved, set the pigs free. His dog barked when he opened the trailer and the gloom lifted as the morning and madness rose. He raced the high hill with 30 pigs, butterflies and bumblebees free in the heather, pine and grass, spring water in an eyebrow for swimming, cooling or christening. On the hill his stick is a crozier held high over his black bowler, bent on freeing pagans, trapped by Christians, he shouts. Hey man, I can see your high field. It's in my trip. The hill is your ancestor. Your father is a Christian. I sowed four cannabis plants in your corn. He climbs into a tree and sheds his suit, wearing only his black bowler, crozier and butterfly socks. The sight of 30 acolytes finding freedom on his altar suits him. His wild eyes become patient as time, watching for the next broken traveller, waiting for Christians to convert. Sweeney's transformation, Bulahivna verses 11 and 12. There were three great shouts as the herded armies clashed and roared out their war cries like stags. When Sweeney heard these howls and echoes assumed into the travelling clouds and amplified through the vaults of space, he looked up 
and was possessed by a dark, rending energy. His brain convulsed, his mind split open, vertigo, hysteria, lurchings and launchings came over him. He f staggered and flapped desperately. He was revolted by the thought of known places and dreamed strange migrations. His fingers stiffened, his feet scuffled and flurried, his heart was startled, his senses were mesmerized, his sight was bent, the weapons fell from his hands and he levitated in a frantic, cumbersome motion like a bird in the air. And Ronan's curse was fulfilled. His feet skimmed over the grasses so lightly he never unsettled a dewdrop. And all that day he was a hurtling visitant of plain and field, bare mountain and bog, thicket and marshland, and there was no hill or hollow, no plantation or forest in Ireland that he did not appear in that day, until he reached Ross Berwick in Glenarkin, where he hid in a yew tree in the glen. Sweeney's despair. You were cursed to walk streets, a faceless, formless creature. No more feeding off welfare payouts. Those bailiffs who tossed you out to live among birds cursed you into a wilderness of noisy streets and cold grey pavement. Windowsill lightering, forgotten stray. You rinse your hair, its clutches of red mat rising from the waters of the barrow. You shake off the feathers of yesterday's tarring. Drag your rag doll body, heavy with self-loading, to a corridor of leaking drain pipes. Gutters overflowing with shit and piss. You drink from discarded beer cans. Newspapers comfort your feet. Searching the footpaths for lost coins. An escape from the taunting, the hating, the haunting of yourself. This is my own story called A Waltz and a Two-Step. In my dream, I am dancing. I sashay in sweeping circles, my skirt a plume of red chiffon. The faster I dance, the lighter I become. Black wings reach out from my back. They beat the air and lift me up. Jim is there holding on to my skirt, pulling me down. I can't hear what he says, yet I know he is angry. A murderous cawing starts as I open the bedroom curtains. Outside, below the window, two carrion crows fright, fight over a frog carcass. They flap and squaw in stiff frosted grass, pecking at the green body. I open the window and throw a glass of water on top of them, sending them away to sulk on the garden fence. It is colder than usual this morning, and my breath reaches out into the room in grey wisps. I pull on a heavy jumper, woolen socks, and run a comb through my hair. I inspect myself in the mirror in the corner. At times, I see strange objects in it, things that are not there, that disappear when I turn around or tell Jim about them. When I do tell him what I see, he tells me I'm just fanciful. He says my imagination plays tricks on me, Today it is just me in the mirror. Downstairs a thin frost scallops the corners of the windows. As quick as I can I light, strike a match inhaling its sulphur smell. I light the thin sticks in the cooker and put the kettle on. The kitchen feels empty. Jim's good coat gone from behind the door, leaving a space. He's gone to the mart and won't be back until lunchtime, or later if he sells anything. We have time now to find the cage. It was like waking on Christmas morning after we set the first trap. I woke early, got up before Jim and went outside to look. Sure enough, I'd caught one. A black lump of a crow stalked one corner of the trap, the colour of death. I left it there, vexed, flapping and cawing. I told him over breakfast that morning that we caught one. I didn't say it excitedly or blurt it out. I was very calm and told him as if it were nothing. Good, he said eating his eggs and slurping his tea. I'll deal with it after this. We stood side by side in front of the cage. You kill it, I said. 
not wanting to sound too eager. I stepped back a bit to give him space and to look uninterested. I knew I'd have plenty more for myself in time. Get the sharp knife, he said to me as he struck, stuck his hand into the cage. I ran back to the house, took the knife from the drawer and returned to Jim, holding the knife behind my back. This way I couldn't see anything in its reflection. I knew Jim and he reached out to take it from me. Dizziness swirled in my head as I handed it over. In the blade's reflection, a woman with wild hair smiled at me. I dropped the knife before Jim could take it. The blade gleamed among the soft dew thawing on the grass. He muttered a curse as I bent down to pick it up. As I got close, the woman waved to me with a black feather in her hand. I haven't got all day, Jim said, snatching the knife from the grass. His big hands wrapped around the bird, and then quick as he laid it down on a tree stump, he sliced through its neck. The head dropped, rolled away, and one eye looked skywards. Blood dribbled down the stump. The headless body twitched for a moment and then relaxed, sunk into itself with a sigh of blood. The dog mouthed up the head and ran away with it, until Jim shouted at him to let it go. He trotted back and dropped it at my feet. I picked it up by the beak and settled it on a stake around the vegetable patch. One eye looked right at me. That'll help scare them off, I said to Jim. He pointed the bloody knife to a wire he'd slung up between two trees. Hang up the body on the wire, he said, as he picked a handful of grass and wiped the blade in, and laid it down next to the body. He left me to clean it up, saying those cows won't milk themselves, walking away down the garden to the yard gate under the Black Stairs Mountains. I'll be in for lunch. Don't forget now, he called back to me. I nodded and blushed. I waited until he was out of sight and then stroked the black feathered body. It was still warm. That was the first one. I always have them done for him now. I tell him he has enough to be doing with the potatoes to weed, the sheep to move, on top of the milking. There aren't enough daylight hours for it all. If I am better able to help him, maybe we'll have more time for other things. We might even go dancing. The kitchen is warming up, the kettle comes to the boil. I spin around the kitchen floor, holding my arms out, pretending I'm dancing with a handsome man. I look into his eyes and smile. We are the envy of the ballroom. The spout whistles, the clock strikes the hour, and I drop my arms and get on with my work. At one end of the washing line, another crow hangs. I can just about reach it. I stand on my tiptoes, caressing the feathers, with the tips of my fingers, careful to avoid the broken neck. The body is cold yet soft. His primaries point down towards the ground and I slide a finger under a wing and pull it down. I hold the feather tight and tug. It comes out with a satisfying release. I trail it along my bare forearm, the black barbs wrinkled and smooth as I brush. I pull out another and it too separates cleanly. This one is smaller and softer. I trace it along my cheek, feeling a tickle on my ear. Whoa! I used to feel light and dizzy when kissed behind the ear. It knocked the breath out of me. The risk was worth the disapproving stares in the dance hall. I used to float home, tingling. I put the crow feathers into my pocket, careful not to bend them, and finish hanging the washing. I know Jim cannot have moved the trap far. Sometimes he forgets to do it. He talks of not needing to trap any more birds. They're getting the message, he says. I told him how I saw him pulling out onions only the day before, and that we did indeed need to keep the blackguards in check. I hunt around for it with chickens picking at the grass behind me. I find the trap and open the, and open the cover and place a potato, pin, potato skin inside. I sit back behind a small apple tree, open my book, and lay the sharp knife beside me. I don't have to wait long, only a couple of pages. Flapping wings alert me to another trapped bird. This time, I've caught a horrible old magpie. Just like Jim did, I carefully open the door and lower in my hand. A beak darts at my fingers. I grab it with all my might and I scream at the bird. His leg catches in the wires, I pull him out and I have to untangle it. He's too big to hold in one hand, so I kneel on him and bring the knife down. Jim usually comes in for dinner at one o'clock, on the dot. Dinner at one, tea is at six, and news is at nine. I try hard to be ready. Today I am prepared. I followed the list, and I'm sure I haven't forgotten anything. 
has something special for Jim. He arrives back from the mart and parks in the yard. He takes off his cap as he comes in the kitchen door. I tell him to sit down and rest himself. I've made him a treat. I take a warm pie from the oven and sit it on the table. Steam spills out as I cut in and Jim licks his lips. How is the mart? I ask. A good day, he says. Sold five. He takes a bite and tells me the pie is the best thing he's eaten in ages. He is pleased with himself, and with a full belly, I know he'll be in good form for the day. As I set the salt down on the table, he catches my wrist. His hand looks dark against my pale skin. He traces a rough finger along the inside of my palm. I stand a moment and let his hand wander up and down my arm. Close your eyes, I tell him. He sits up and puckers at his lips, waiting for a kiss. I take a feather from my pocket and very gently touch his neck. His shoulders hunch up in pleasure as I run the feather behind his ear. He shivers. Your hands are the softest, he says, reaching up to take mine. How are they so soft? He asks. Do that again. This time I take the sharp knife from my other pocket and I draw the tip of the blade along his neck. I think about asking him to take me dancing. Haven't I earned it with all the work I do? It takes him a moment to realize what is touching him. I push it into his stubble skin and tell him to stand up. I tell him he'll dance me around the kitchen like we used to. He nods and puts his hand around my waist. I lay the knife down on the table and wink at the, at the woman smiling in the blade. I hum a waltz and then a two-step. He holds me gingerly. I am like a little bird in his arms, so light and nimble. We glide around the lino floor until it gets dark. At nearly 40, you'd think I'd know all there is to know about kissing. Yet, you manage to teach new things. Your habit of biting my lower lip, pulling it to you, stretched between your teeth. I never said anything. It hurt. Like when you bit my nipple, delicate as you tried to be. I was the first person you did this with, and it amazed me how this instinct found itself in you, wild, unfettered you. I'd have either back, your teeth on my lower lip, my left nipple. I'd swap both for the vertigo I felt the minute I knew it was over. Then I staggered and lurched, convulsed, one minute a man, the next some wild bird squawking, startled, across the sky. Sweeney returns to his wife. Restless as wing beats of memory, I hover above you, and your bed still warm from your lover. Remember when you played the promise game with me? Sun and moon would have died if ever you had lost your Sweeney. But you have broken trust, unmade it like a bed, not mine in the dawn frost, but yours that he invaded. Welcome here, my crazy tooth, my first and last and favourite. I am easy now, and yet I wasted at the cruel news of you being beasted. There is more welcome for the prince who preens for you and struts to those amorous banquets where Sweeney feasted once. All the same, I would prefer a hollow tree and Sweeney Bear, that sweetest game we used to play, to banqueting with him today. I tell you, Sweeney, if I were given the pick of all in earth and Ireland, I'd rather go with you, live sinless and sup up water and watercress. But cold and hard as stone lies Sweeney's path, through the beds of Lizardolan, there I go to earth, in panic, 
starved and bare, a ripple of skin and bones. I am yours no longer, and you are another man's. My poor tormented lunatic, when I see you like this, it makes me sick. Your cheek gone pale, your skin all scars, ripped and scored by thorns and briars. And yet I hold no grudge, my gentle one. Christ ordained my bondage and exhaustion. I wish we could fly away together, be rolling stones, birds of a feather. I'd swoop to pleasure you at night and huddle close on the roost at night. It is clear from the passage that Darina has read that the facets of humanity, our relationships with them, are as poignant today as they were in the 6th century. Love, forgiveness, compassion, coupled with the madness that plagues Sweeney, is explored through co-op writing as the transformation continues in Buddha Hivna. Sweeney searches for salvation eventually accepting the kindness of Bishop Morley toward the end of his days. Horse man, your skin was not white. A sallow, smooth, svelte silk, bristled by soft beard, clothing angular cheeks, a jawline worthy of a sultan some sage caliph. I remember the day we stopped in the corner shop for tobacco and the lady hurried and impatient, stalled before this dark skin, chestnut eyes, <coughs> haughtily clipping out the price of tobacco. And you handed her coins, precisely totted up, every cent accounted for. Regal, unruffled, silent, your bearing spoke as you handed over what had been asked. Your eyes gleamed like studded silver, your teeth gemstones set in gold. A horseman worthy to ride out with Congal Sweeney Suleiman. Sweeney's legend. At times, spinning me into madness, filling my head with him, Sweeney's legend tormented me. A reminder that he too wandered from place to place, disconnected, banished, looking for a break from the stone pillow, a soft place to shelter, safe enough to envision home, his children, his loves. He found doorways, cars and containers, covered himself with sleeping bag and newspapers heralding the end of the tiger's roar. While in my dreams, I climb high with him, a tree off James's Street, imagining each foothold he had taken. And as our feet leave the sycamore branch, I quickly take his hand, and together again we fly. Jerry saw him last on Grafton Street, with a fractured bone by his side. Bonnie saw him behind the central bank, in heated discussion with a guard. I last saw him near the hospital, with some winos that he knew. <coughs> Jovial, he bantered and joked with them, far flung from the roots. I watched as he shared the bags of clothes he'd left stored in my shed. Watched him size up Jimmy, Jimmy for his Levi jeans and Johnny, his safety boots. Some knew him as charmer, builder, daddy. Others called him a scumbag, waster, junkie. Each year, when autumn begins to bite and evenings start getting shorter, 
I call to him. Firstborn, love, son. Is aim a book all in Marav, on solace of lotness veilesh. My beautiful boy is dead, the light of heaven to me. An archer's tale. Shapes move slowly, clunking across the damp grass and towards the dark forest. John had seen his archers into place the night before, each slowly melding with the trees. The enemy gathered at the lower end of the hill, pitching their tents and lighting their fires. A raucous chorus of merriment echoing around the forest's edge as English scouts counted the enemy's numbers. Well, outnumbered ten to one at least, Aye, and they have heavy horse down there. Crossbow, a knight with best Italian armour. The men were panicked, underfed and weak, from days of marching in an attempt to reach boats at the coast. The enemy had hurried them along the way, but never really in a meaningful way. Some of John's men had already deserted to the countryside, hoping to flee back to England unscathed by the war. Listen, lads, even if we are outnumbered, we'll still never have made them boats. Stand now and we just might get out with our skins. John Hancock spoke in a harsh voice, a pig farmer from the Dale. He had marched to war three times before and each had seen him home safe. I've been an archer for the king many a year now, lads, and I've never seen the likes of it. We marched, we died, and not a frog to show for it. It is time we give him what for. His words, though confident, did little for the men. Fever was rampant in the camp, and the stench of rotten limbs palpable. Ah, but young squire tells me the enemy nobles are still coming here, riding all night, and they just slaughtered us. Them stakes are there for a reason, lad. Archers fall back as knights get up on us, and from there we can still prick them as they weave in and out of the stakes. Ain't no big horse going up there. Hancock sat back and drew, drew a goose feathered arrow from his pouch. The bodkin head shimmered in the fire's light. I don't care what armour you have, that'll slow you right down. I hear frogs are taking archers' fingers, so we can't draw a bow on them. You see that before, John. The men echoed the story of archers missing draw fingers. Aye, I've seen it, lads. Two fingers and a hot night. Best not be taken by them. Draw your blade and fight. Die if you must. But don't let them have your fingers. God will see to you. God sees to his own monk, and I ain't seen him on a battlefield. Take you and your God-fearing shite over yonder to frogs. I reckon they'll need it more than us come dawn. John Hancock, you know he walks with you, has done all this time, allowed you to be wicked in his name. And he still has your forgiveness. Begone, monk, or I'll take my wicked ways to your neck. This is your last night, John. Enjoy it, for tomorrow the Lord sends you to hell. Ah, and I'll see you there, monk. It'll be my bare arse that greets you on the way in to be covered in a young comely maid. Roars of laughter followed the monk as he slunk away to bring God's word to the men the night before their deaths. John watched the monk pass by the shadow of death, John's constant companion. Will you join me tomorrow, John? The rasping voice of death was close, and John could taste his breath. Not tomorrow. A silver mist hung in the tr over the trees. Few birds moved and those that did kept to the long grass and dark ditches. Shining, clanking armor was visible as the morning sun quickly gathered its heat and burnt the mist from the wet land. The incline, it didn't look much, John thought, as he looked towards the enemy standards. The black shape of heavy horses and snaking lines of infantry visible around them. The plain below was wide enough to show their strength, but as the land climbed towards John and his archers, it narrowed. He was grateful for that, and believed the king was too. 
Their numbers only just filled the span of land where they had formed up to meet the mighty enemy. The king's guards stood behind John's archers and then the supply wagons. Retreat, they were told. It's not an option. The nobles were safe as they'd be captured and ransomed back to their families, but the common man had no such luxury. If they were captured, it meant certain death. Hancock stood with, his, with the other archers watching the army below. Their own squires tramped to and fro, hauling equipment to their masters. John watched a young squire march across the hill towards him. And when he stood before him, John realized he was no more than nine or ten, a boy with dreams of becoming a knight someday. What is it, lad? <laughs> My lord requests that your archers lead the opening volley on his flag. Do you hear that, lads? We got first crack at a whip on them. Whoops and hollers erupted behind him. The squire nodded as John began placing arrows in the ground, each shaft straight and tipped with cold steel bodkins. The goose feathers for flight had become attacks on the common man at home, their Sundays filled with bowmanship. Times were hard, but the spoils of the few battles they had on this campaign were better than any John could remember. John thought of asking for a bit more land and buying a few more pigs for his wife and sons. It would be good to have full bellies this winter, and a crow he could peck at someone else's door. Shall we send that young boy to meet his ancestors, John? John turned to look at the billowing cloak of that. You leave him be. Plenty of others here for you to take. Are we feeling weak, John? John smiled and continued his work. I am not weak, friend. As we always say, tis a lovely day to meet thy maker. John checked his short archer sword, was loose in the scabbard. The string on his bow thought, ready to take life. He allowed his fingers to slip beneath his hat and felt the second string. It too was waxed and ready. I will take many souls today, John, the young, the old, the weak, the sick, perhaps even your king. John looked at the men on either side of him, some as young as the square, others as old and battle-weary as himself, and some older yet. Before the sun was high in the sky, he knew the ground around him would be dark with blood, and the crow, he would begin to grow fat on the dead. Age, John, it catches up on us all, and then we travel to eternal darkness. John stretched out his arms and rounded his neck, taking away the stiffness. That was coming, he knew, but not today. We traveled to feast with our ancestors, to the halls of the great befores, where they feast night and day. Stories, John, there is nothing beyond that. The worm will enter your body and decay will follow. We bring that to you. We deliver pestilence, famine, war, and death. And these great feasts are served with our hands, and therefore those who work in tile shall be rewarded with maggots and decay, John. There is no great hall, no great feast, and the ancestors of bygone days are piles of dust that blow across plains. Stories, John to help you sleep at night. There is no deliverance, no glorious kingdom, no rewards for those who reap, sow, and tile. Just decay. John smiled as another volley of arrows peppered the ground among the advancing enemy. Horses screeched in terror as riders were thrown and trampled. Six thousand arrows darkened the skies as the enemy beat their advance. The sun was high and the ground sodden and dark with blood and sweat. First advance the enemy had sent churned the ground to a cesspit of piss, muck and blood. John's men were launching ten arrows a minute and six thousand archers were hard at work to slow the advance. Some were unlucky and crossbow bolts found marks among his men, but each fallen man was replaced by more father. 
The enemy engaged men along the line, each in thick, heavy armor and carrying large broadswords, and attacked with a viciousness John had never seen before. But the king's men stood firm and tackled each advance, driving them back, or capturing them as they yielded. Prisoners were herded back to the supply wagons and held there by a few armed men. The king stood at the line's center in full armor, battling the enemy with his lords. Squires fought, died, and cried, as their mother, cried for their mothers as the battle raged. John's brow was heavy with sweat and his arms tired from the constant knock drawn loose. With each volley, he watched the pale horse reap the souls of the fallen. Death's hands rather gathering them to him. John watched as his arrows fell upon the helpless around the pale rider, and with each kill, Death whispered, Perhaps yours is to serve me, John, a harbinger of my will. Water boats flew along the line, and as John paused for refreshment, he saw the young squire, eyes wide and throat slit by a crossbow bolt. A crow picked at the young boy's wound, savouring the warm flesh. John drew an arrow and took the crow before grabbing the boy and dragging him behind his men. The clash of steel and of bodkins faded as John cradled the squire. The battle died around him, falling to silence as he rocked the young boy in his ar arms. The men still followed the order, knock, draw, loose the sky overhead black with the shafts of an army. Get him to the baggage train and get him back in line, Hancock, passing man at arms bellowed. Without thinking, John stood and slowly walked back through the lines of fighting men. Tears streaked his face as he laid his squire on the burgeoning pile of bodies. John looked at the enemy prisoners, hands tied, legs bound, and only a few men guarding them. The pommel of his short sword brought no comfort. Looking around, he saw death everywhere, his black coat, cloak gathering souls as it swept through the dying. John sunk to the ground and stared, the world turning black around him. A cold breath touched his ear. I am still here, John, waiting, biding my time for you. Will you not join me today? No, not today. You've already taken enough. Leave me. John turned to look at the body of the young boy, blood stained and pale. Why? Because it is what the world turns upon, John. Death, misery, decay, hardship. We reap those who sow the least and allow those who suffer to endure. John pulled himself to his feet and looked around. Gold wagons, food carts, lords, nobles in the scum of his homeland. Reap what we sow. His feet dragged him towards the rear of the baggage area and into the trees beyond. Looking back, he could see Dad watching him, his cloak billowing in the breeze. Dad smiled at John as their eyes met. Serve me, John. Reap for me. Turning his back, John melted with the trees. His time with war was done. This is another poem by Bev Carberry. Heart with one purpose. To see hearts with one purpose is enchanting, even to a stone, as life lived without love can turn a heart to a stone. The stone lies still, turned to the sky, recording everything. I love the sky. Even the howls and echoes of war are assumed into the traveling clouds. They sometimes darken and gather over people and land, causing cursing and sadness as even the birds flock and fly away. I look to the clouds. You can see trees, animals, people turning to the birds. Once at the crossroads of spring, I saw the clouds and sky join with one purpose. Color, movement, shapes, combined to perform the most exquisite opera. And this land became enchanted 
with its own verse and music. Another day. <coughs> he sits on the windowsill all day outside the corner pub, going through his pockets, fingering, fisting, scratching. You can smell the desperation mincing with the weeks and months of heavy drinking. He finds a betting slip rolled into a white pebble, curses his luck, the last few pence squandered, that fucking nag is still running. The Guinness Bar lorry labours to a halt. Um, the stout barrel man with gloved hands rolls out the kegs, lugs crates of green and brown bottles. They fall. Smashed glass and foam gather in a pothole. He waits until the lorry and the stout barrel man have gone. Kneels and weeps in shame and gratitude and drinks salvation from the ground. Sweeney pursued by the five heads, verses 64 and 65. God answered Ronan's prayer. When Sweeney was out on the uplands of the fuse, he halted, stock still. A strange apparition rose before him at midnight. Bleeding, headless torsos and disembodied heads, five scraggy, goat-bearded heads, screamed and bounced this way and that over the road. When he got among them, they were talking to each other. He's a madman, said the first head. A madman from Ulster, said the second. Follow him well, said the third. May the pursuit be long, said the fourth. Until he reaches the sea, said the fifth. They rose in a flock coming for him, but he soared away in front, skimming from thicket to thicket, and no matter how wide the glen that opened before him, he bounded from edge to edge, from the top of one hill to the top of the next. The heads were pursuing him, lolling and baying, snapping and yelping, whining and squealing. They nosed at his calves and his thighs, they breathed on his shoulder, they nuzzled the back of his neck, they went bumping off tree trunks and rock face, they spouted and plunged like a waterfall, until he gave them the slip and escaped in a swirling tongue of cloud. He had lost them, goat head and dog head, and a whole terrifying pack. But his previous wandering and flying were nothing compared with what he suffered now. For he was started into a fit which lasted six weeks until he perched one night in the top of a tree on the summit of, summit of Shlieve Enoch. In the morning he began lamenting. Sweeney's dream. I remember the amorous banquet I feasted at once. That night I dreamed Olympian things. Now I'm an old knife without a fork, a banana skin empty and rotten, a shriveled apple pip, a sun-dried orange skin green and musty, a nearly empty bottle of whiskey, one last drink and I'm empty beside the bottle of fish sauce fit for the bin. I arrange and rearrange my feathers in the rain. I dream Olympian things. How the sun and moon, the stars, came dancing across the skies. That moment you danced a slow dance, normally reserved for women. You'd only ever danced it in your bedroom alone. Then you danced it for me. I am a crumpled piece of paper. I store ingredients ticked off and cooked for dinner. A bottle of orange after the party gone flat. That balloon stuck to the ceiling, shriveled and shrunk. A cold piece of sausage fallen to the floor nobody wants to touch. A dried carrot left in the shed all the cold winter. I dream Olympian things. I arrange and rearrange my feathers in the rain. Like an old blanket in an age of duvets, you tossed me aside for another. The cosmic wizard has lost his wand 
and no one can make it right. I dream Olympian things, arranging and rearranging my feathers in the rain. I remember that amorous banquet I feasted at once. That night, I dreamed Olympian things. Nell McJones. Alders concealed the house. Red lights penetrated cheap curtains marking it. Inside, lavender scent, girls shadowed under mercury lamps. A suggestive eye thrown his way. He was new, having tourist money and gagging to pay. This was the mood. It travelled the air like darts customers threw at the red cycloptic bullseye. A bravado game for the wait. Jokes cracked when the aim was off. She'll be safe enough tonight. After some visits, the girls knew him, laughed, cajoled, talked seriously. Why he came? His wife had left. She was mean. A common story. His weakness revealed, they touched his arm. Knowing from Nell, it was kindness reeled them in. <clears throat> Tripping. I walk. Hide myself beneath a hoodie. I found discarded in Penny's car park. Tonight I have no home. No key left out for an adolescent junkie flying. I kick an empty coffee cup up Tulla Street. Forgotten, thrown away. It is crushed beneath my feet and is reborn a phoenix in bursts of green, yellow, red. I see Jesus huddled in a bus shelter. His beard is feathers. He waves a one-way ticket to St. Mullins. Smokes a giant as I trip past the pull-down shades of sleeping buildings. Way through the A in silence, searching for the Liberty Tree for sanctuary, from twisted people, pulsing daylight, coming down. I would climb its iron limbs, perch like Sweeney, and wait for a saint to come and talk me down. A Wallam Coney the crown, I wad o ribloida on down. Garden spare sair of a sucker. A kudu manum. A geisha gna corla na gohne chopped as a gin mocked. Agus maim or jalaf. Bawn agus fullof. Rona gna shrocka mo hail. Le titan mo gwail. Tan brishta ishte. Tome e mo smidarini eranurlor. Meantin trikela. Manum kyangelta. Fan lam a hibna. A wad lam dollar rashter lat. I'd like to live in a tree, far from the troubles of the world, near the sky free and easy, to find myself, listen to the counsel of voices coming and going, and me a statue white and empty, sorrowing with the disintegration of my life, disintegration of family and relationships. I'm broken inside and in bits on the floor, my mind upside down, my soul is tied. Wait for me, Sweeney, I'd like to go with you. All during the next year, the madman kept coming back to Mulling. One day he would go to Winish Boffin in West Connacht, another day to lovely Assaro. Some days he would view the clean lines of Slemish. Some days he would be shivering on the moorns. But whatever he, whenever he went, every night he would be back for Vespers in St Mullins. Mulling ordered his cook to leave aside some of each day's milking for Sweeney's supper. This cook's name was Murgle and she was married to a swineherd at Mulling, of Mullings called Mungan. Anyhow, Sweeney's supper was like this. She would sink her heel to the ankle in the nearest cow dung and fill the hole to the brim with new milk. Then Sweeney would sneak into the deserted corner of the milking yard and lap it up. One night there was a row between Murgle and another woman, in the course of which the woman said, 
If you do not prefer your husband, it is a pity you cannot take up with some other man than the loony you have been meeting all year. The hard sister was waiting, was within earshot and listening, but said nothing until the next morning. Then when she saw Murgle going to leave the milk in the cow dung beside the hedge where Sweeney roosted, she came to her brother and said, Are you a man at all? Your wife is in the hedge yonder with another man. Jealousy shook him like a brainstorm. He got up in a sudden fury, seized a spear from a rack in the house and made for the madman. Sweeney was down swirling the milk out of the cow dung with his side exposed towards the herd who let go at him with the spear. It went into Sweeney at the nipple of his left breast, went through him and broke his back.